Namaste. So let's take a look at the next verse of Vichara Sangraham, verse 16. The question here is, how does the ego, the mind, the soul, and Brahman become identified with each other? Why don't we see them separately? Why do we see them as one thing and then call it I? Ramana explains. Devotee, how do egoity, soul, self, and Brahman come to be identified? And Ramana draws a table. The example is on the left, the exemplified is on the right. The iron ball is the example of egoity. The heated iron ball exemplifies the soul, which appears as a superimposition on the self. The fire in the heated iron ball symbolizes the light of consciousness, the immutable Brahman, which shines in the soul in everybody. And the flame of fire, which remains as one, represents the all-pervading Brahman, which remains as one. So here he's referring to a famous example in the Vedas, that when a blacksmith heats an iron ball, see, in the, in the good old days, <laughs> wrought iron came in the form of balls about the size of a baseball because of the way that it was manufactured in the old days before blast furnaces and all that industrial scale stuff when it was done like a cottage industry. So then the blacksmith would put the ball in the fire and heat it up using the bellows to make the fire very hot until the iron ball is glowing, red hot, or even orange. And then he takes it out with his tongs and begins to hammer it into shape. And he can make all manner of things by this method, you know, from the original ball-shaped iron. Then he hammers and draws and cuts and shapes and makes all kinds of different tools and stuff. So the example in the Vedas is that when the iron ball is heated in the fire, it becomes as good as fire. If you touch it to something flammable, it will cause it to flare up. See? So even though an iron ball by nature is cold, when it sits in the fire for a long time, it acquires the qualities of fire. So the example is that the body, mind, and ego, even though they're actually inert, acquire the qualities of Brahman by association or by reflection, or they become a superimposition on Brahman so that the Brahman shines through them and appears to be coming from uh, the soul or the body or the mind. But actually, the light is coming from Brahman itself. So this is a famous example given in the Upanishads. Now, what does that mean? From the examples given above, it is clear how egoity, soul, witness, and all witness come to be identified. Just as in the wax lump that is with the smith, numerous and varied metal particles lie, included, and all of them appear to be one wax lump. So also in deep sleep, the gross and subtle bodies of all the individual souls are included in the cosmic maya, which is nescience, of the nature of sheer darkness. 
And since the souls are resolved in the self becoming one with it, they see everywhere darkness alone. From the darkness of sleep, the subtle body, egoity, arises, and from that the gross body arises. Even as the egoity arises, it appears superimposed on the nature of the self, like the heated iron ball. Thus, without the soul, jiva, which is the mind or egoity conjoined with the consciousness light, there is no witness of the soul, that is, the self. And without the self, there is no Brahman, that is, the all-witness. Just as when the iron ball is beaten into various shapes by the smith, the fire that is in it does not change thereby in any manner. Even so, the soul may be involved in ever so many experiences and undergo pleasures and pains, and yet the self-light that is in it does not change in the least thereby. And like space, it is the all-pervasive pure knowledge that is one and shines in the heart as Brahman. So even though it uses a very old-fashioned example, this metaphor is true because it expresses the real nature of our individuality, consciousness, and the self. Remember, the self, with a capital S, is Brahman, the all-witness, he calls it. And then that gets apparently divided up into different individual beings because out of ignorance, the Brahman gets covered and reflected in the ego, mind, and body. So, to try to understand this better, let's put it in reverse. <laughs> we start with Brahman. Brahman is basically God, the Absolute, the all-pervading, all-knowing, all-beautiful source of everything. But Brahman then gets covered by ignorance. Ignorance means sleep. So most people, most of us, are asleep. We are thinking that we're an individual being. But this is only because of identification with the body and the mind. But be it as it may, this egoity, this sense of individuality, of separateness, covers Brahman and makes it appear that the consciousness is of an individual nature even though, actually, Brahman is beyond all that. And when this individual consciousness is reflected in the mind and the body, then we have a human being with all of the symptoms <laughs> that are attached. Uh, I use the word attached deliberately because what happens is we become attached to the body. We become attached to its extensions, such as possessions and labels and designations, names and forms. And we identify with those things as possessions. So because the world is always changing, our possessions are too. The body is changing, the mind is changing, so what to speak of the external objects that we identify with? That means we periodically have to experience separation from them. Because after all, they are not really the self. Buddha said there are three criteria of the phenomenal existence. One is anicca, impermanence. Two is dukkha suffering, or unsatisfactoriness. And three is anatma, not-self. 
So because of these three, this is the problem with material existence. It's not really authentic. We want to identify the body, the mind, the ego, and the self and say that I am a conscious living entity, a soul, a jiva, one who is born. But the problem is that the body and mind and everything connected to them are temporary and they're imperfect. And even if we get what we want, there's always something wrong. <laughs> and finally, they have to, uh, we have to let them go because they're impermanent. And, and as far as the last one, they're not self. So even though we may be attached and identified to these external objects, including the body and mind, because they are perceived, they are not the witness, huh? they are not the seer, the drik, as we went around last time, they are the drishya, the seen. So they cannot be the self, because the self is always subjective. So in this way, we rattle around in this world, <laughs> trying this and trying that, and never really being satisfied. If there's any satisfaction, it's very temporary and fleeting. And like I said, impermanent. And because the world is not self, the world can never really meet our needs. It doesn't really understand us. <laughs> It has its own ways, its own trajectory, which, of course, has got to be different from our desires. So we may want this and not want that. Uh, we may care about something very much, but the universe really is on its own track. So whether the outcome is what we desire or not, uh, it's, it's of no account to the universe. What are we? Simply a temporary arising, a bubble of foam on the waves of the ocean. What is that to the ocean? It's nothing. So in the same way, the deep ocean of this world is actually Brahman. And Brahman is detached. Brahman has no desires, no actions, no change or transformation. Brahman is not a doer. Huh? The whole creation arises simply as an epiphenomenon of the existence of Brahman. Brahman doesn't have to do anything to create the world. The world just happens simply by Brahman's presence. Try to understand. It's just like the captain of a boat. He doesn't try to make a wake. Huh? He's really not interested in creating a wake. But as the boat moves, it creates a wake simply by its presence, simply by its motion across the water. The wake is an epiphenomenon of the boat. It's not the main purpose of the boat. Huh? The, bo the purpose of the boat is to go somewhere on the water. But the wake is created as a byproduct automatically. So in the same way, this phenomenal world occurs automatically as an epiphenomenon or byproduct of the existence of Brahman. And it is created as a single, seamless whole, just like Brahman itself. In fact, the world is Brahman, <laughs> but it's simply an appearance in Brahman, like a mirage or a moving picture. We've used the example so many times. 
So don't get attached to it. Don't get attached to being an individual. Or if you find that you are attached, then you have to do something to loosen that attachment and find your real self in Brahman. And that is the perfection of enlightenment. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung.